Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Thomas, and um, good morning to all our distinguished colleagues and participants who are tuning in today to this, the sixth of our technical webinar sessions. And we are very pleased to, to have you all, particularly those who are joining us from very odd hours of the day. On behalf of the Under Secretary General of the Department of Economic and Social Affairs and uh, the high representatives of the least developed countries, landlocked developing countries and uh, small island developing states, I would like to welcome each and every one of you to, to, this, um, to this session. Now this morning we have with us uh, three organizations who have kindly agreed to participate and make presentations. We have the Food and Agricultural Organization. We have the Oxford, the, um, Oxford University um, Poverty and Human Development Initiative. And we also have the World Meteorological Organization. For the Food and Agriculture FAO, we welcome specifically Mr. Jose Rosero, Uncayo and Mr. Piero Conforti. And from the University of Oxford, we acknowledge the presence of Ms. Sabina Alkaya. And from the WMO, we welcome Mr. Robert Stefanski. To all you uh, three, uh, four colleagues, um, on behalf of the team here at the United Nations headquarters, we thank you so much for your willingness to participate and we are really looking forward to your presentation this morning. And to all our colleagues participants, as we have always said, your interactive participation is very much welcomed. Dissenting opinion or any inquisitive questions is very much welcome for it. They will strengthen the exercise that the, we are doing in, in this respect. With those few remarks, uh, Ms. Thomas, I'll hand the, the floor back to you to moderate our discussion once again. Thank you kindly. Thank you very much, Sai. And uh, we are going to dive right in. Um, we will be starting with the FAO colleagues this morning. So, Jose and uh, Piero, over to you, please. Okay, the typical issue of we muting the microphone. Do you hear me well? Yes, loud and clear, loud and clear. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, colleagues, for giving us the opportunity to, to present this work, okay, on measuring uh, rural poverty from a multidimensional uh, perspective. Uh, we do this in the context of a meeting that focuses on the vulnerability on the seed countries, because we believe that this kind of work is relevant for the seeds. As we will explain during the presentation, there are some commonalities defined by the way we conceptualize and we operationalize the specificities of the rural sector that can be applied for the for the seeds. Having said that, let me start the presentation. Um, hello. I see that someone is, is uh, not muting his microphone. Hello? Okay. Do you hear me well? Hello, do you hear me well? Yes, Jose, I can hear you very well. Yes, yeah, so if everybody can mute uh, your microphones, please, because I'm am, I am hearing a uh, noise in the back. Is the screen okay. visible with the slide? Is, is visible yes, the screen, is, the screen is visible. We will go through and uh, ensure that everyone who is who should be muted will be muted. Go ahead, please, Jose. Thank you. So having said that, let me start the presentation. Uh, and before uh, going into explaining what is behind this index, meaning what are the dimensions and the methods that uh, we have used to build uh, uh, an index, that could allow us to measure rural poverty and, uh, and uh, monitor progress across uh, time, uh, I think that is uh, good to start reflecting on uh, what motivated this exercise. Uh, 
why to focus on the rural sector and its specificities, and why to do it uh, from a multidimensional uh, approach. Can we go to the next slide, Piero, please? Okay, on the first point, the message that I would like to transmit is that um, although there are differences on estimates between the mo uh, between uh, using uh, monetary and non-monetary uh, measurements for, po for, for poverty, a clear conclu conclusion is that uh, poverty is predominantly um, uh, rural. And this is the case no matter what is the approach that we are using for measurement. Um, so if we take the monetary metric of the that, that the World Bank uses um, using the uh, 1.9 uh, dollars uh, per day uh, uh, PPP poverty line, uh, we find that 81.3 percent of the monetary poor live in rural uh, areas. Similarly, if we uh, if we take the 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 results from the uh, global multidimensional uh, poverty index that collects uh, information across 105 uh, countries. And this is basically results that has been analyzed for, for the 2018 uh, update. We find that 85% uh, of the population live in rural, uh, of the poor population live in rural uh, areas. In the same way, using the, uh, the multidimensional uh, measurement of poverty of the World Bank, we find that, uh, that the estimate is 83.5% uh, of the poor uh, live in, in rural areas. So here, uh, the message is that no matter what type of measurement we are taking, uh, we have plenty of evidence that shows that poverty is predominantly a rural uh, phenomenon. Next slide, please. So uh, despite the acknowledgement that poverty in rural areas is more pronounced than in urban areas, nevertheless, no comparable measure has been created that is tailored specifically to the characteristics of rural areas. And that's the point that we want to make because we strongly believe that uh, rural people livelihoods are different from those of the urban uh, dwellers. In this sense, uh, to try to use a generic metric that is not designed to measure the levels of deprivation that are uh, specific of the rural sector tends to hide the reality. I will not necessarily uh, reflect uh, a rural concept of well-being and as such will uh, fail to be uh, a tool to monitor progress uh, across, uh, across time. Rural poverty uh, will be uh, argued later in the presentation as well. It is characterized by a myriad of intertwined challenges that make it distinct from uh, urban uh, poverty. Uh, rural people live differently. They derive their income differently. They may live in remote and sparse, sparsely populated areas, such as forests, savannas. They depend more on agricultural income and on the management of natural uh, resources. They are also more exposed to covariate shocks, um, such as crop and livestock losses due, due to natural disasters. Um, also, they, they are uh, exposed to to, to climate uh, uh, events such as poor rainfall, droughts, uh, as well of a specific crop and animal uh, uh, diseases. Uh, all of this, basically, in terms of um, uh, of, I mean, it affects differently than a population that live in other in, in other parts, such as the such as the urban uh, sector. Um, also, they, they suffer from uh, exclusion from social uh, services due to the remoteness and political uh, exclusion. In that sense, they have lower social protection uh, coverage, lower social uh, assistance, and uh, insurance, in general terms, is often more, uh, more informal. Next slide, please. 
So considering all of these specificities, we believe that if we want to, to measure uh, uh, in a correct way uh, poverty in the rural in the rural sector, and a specific uh, measurement is needed, and it has and this measurement has to be built uh, from a multidimensional uh, approach, because there are different types of dimensions that that affect the living conditions of the of the rural population that needs to be considered uh, in order to to uh, to to have a, a construct a mesh a, a metric that uh, that uh, can be effectively uh, used. In this sense, the rural MPI that is proposed by this uh, exercise that, uh, by the way, we have done together with the, with the University of, of Oxford uh, with, with FAO, uh, and tries to embed different type of, of dimensions. Uh, as uh, Piero will explain more, uh, more in detail uh, in, the next, in the next slide, but let me highlight the ones that make it different from uh, other type of approaches that have been that have been used. So um, uh, the first one is that uh, we will take into account the specificity of the rural livelihoods to the economy and the and the environment, especially everything that has to do with the availability of a specific uh, assets that uh, the rural uh, households have available in order to derive their uh, their uh, means of, of living. Uh, second, we will basically take into account the vulnerabilities of the rural livelihood to shocks and changes in the natural uh, uh, environment. And then, of course, the coping strategies that the rural population has and the other means that they have in order to manage the risk in which uh, that they uh, that they are uh, exposed. We, um, then the last next slide that is my last uh, slide before giving the floor to to Piero is just to highlight uh, up from uh, specific uh, specific limitations that we have found uh, in this exercise of trying to derive a uh, multidimensional poverty index for the rural sector. The first one is the issue of not having a universal definition of rural uh, areas. Uh, there are different criteria to define uh, rural areas. The ones that work with data and work with the statistics know this very, uh, very well. We have different, uh, I mean, different countries use different type of definitions of, of what, it, what they consider to be rural areas, coming from political administrative definitions to definitions that take into consideration the, the density of the population or the remoteness of access to, to services. So there is a there is a combination of definition that makes basically uh, difficult this exercise of trying to derive uh, something that can be applied uh, at a global at a global scale. The second uh, limitation is uh, uh, is that the rural areas as a concept. Uh, I mean, we don't have to take this as, as an static concept. We usually have this in our heads that. Uh, urban uh, versus rural is a dichotomous variable. It's a one-zero kind of variable uh, that basically stays like that uh, on time, which is not the case. We have to think uh, uh, in urban-rural as a continuum, uh, uh, and especially under the context of rural uh, transformation that takes place along this type of continuum of rural and urban uh, characteristics. Uh, with this, let me please give the floor to, to Piero to go more into detail of what is behind the, the index. Piero. Thank you, Jose. Um, so, essentially, um, let's uh, start seeing exactly more, more uh, directly what we did we do with this uh, computation of the multi uh, dimensional power, rural multidimensional poverty index. In general, we apply the technology that uh, is behind any multidimensional poverty index, which is essentially the Alcar and Foster uh, methodology, uh, which uh, uh, proposes an index that is uh, uh, made up of an intensity element and a headcount element. Of course, it's a very useful property for, uh, for policy purposes because it's uh, a way to combine something that says how much poor the poor are and how many the poor are vis-a-vis -vis 
interpopulation. And this is a, a little bit the way this kind of indicators, this class of indicators is uh, computed. So we start from a list of uh, uh, indicators that, in, uh, that point to deprivation. And we set for each indicator a deprivation cutoff, something that uh, in a binary way defines a deprivation condition. Then we assign weights to each of these indicators, and then we decide a poverty cutoff K, which is essentially saying that a person is considered to be multidimensionally poor if he or she has a number of these indicators higher than a given percentage in a condition of deprivation. And typically we start from a value of one third. So we say that a person is multidimensionally poor if at least one third of the indicator chosen to uh, define the poverty cutoff uh, is in a status of deprivation. And then we can compute in this way a headcount ratio and an intensity, which is a sum of weighted deprivations uh, uh, divided by the total number of multidimensionally poor people so that we have an idea of how these things are uh, computed. So that's one of the starting points we use. The other starting point we use is the global multidimensional poverty index that is computed by OFI. Uh, with uh, an annual exercise. In this uh, context, uh, this index, which is uh, based on data that comes from the uh, um, uh, mix uh, uh, surveys and the DHS, the demographic and health surveys, which is which are readily available in many countries, and they is essentially looking at deprivation through three dimensions. One is health, one is education, one is living standard. And uh, these three dimensions of poverty are assigned equal weights. So health uh, uh, has one third, education has one third, and living standard have one third. And then uh, inside each of these dimensions, depending on the number of indicators, the uh, weights are divided up. So nutrition and child mortality compose the health component. Uh, education is made of the years of school and school attendance. A number of more detailed characteristics are used to uh, generate the living standard dimension. So we basically took this idea, this structure, and we included some more dimensions that we believe and uh, are uh, relevant for uh, defining uh, rural poverty. And uh, in this, we were supported by a wide expert consultation that uh, started this process. So uh, a number of experts gathered for a couple of days in Oxford, now a couple of, day, a couple of years ago, uh, and discussed widely about what dimensions might be relevant in that context. And the general consensus was that uh, it was interesting to look at livelihoods and to look at risks as elements that uh, make up a specificity of, uh, of uh, rural multidimensional poverty. So we took the same uh, three dimensions that are in the global MPI and we added uh, education uh, to education and living standard uh, and uh, something resembling health. We uh, added uh, a dimension of rural livelihoods and uh, a dimension of risk. Uh, we had to modify slightly the type of setup also in the health uh, dimension, which we relabeled as a food security and nutrition dimension essentially owing to the type of data we, uh, we've been uh, accessing and will be able to access. Uh, the, the kind of data that we've been using are essentially the data of the Living Standard Measurement Study of the World Bank that has pretty much a lot of details. Uh, in agriculture, they are very uh, rurally oriented type of service to some extent. So they have a lot of very good information in that uh, area. Uh, but they don't have as much as the demographic health service on uh, other topics. Like, and so we had to adapt a little bit uh, this, uh, this structure. And essentially, we, uh, uh, for what concerns the health, the education, and the living standard, the main change was to uh, substitute, let's say, the health dimension with the food security and nutrition dimension, including uh, uh, the household's probability of being severely food insecure based on the food insecurity experience scale. This is SDG indicator 212, for which we are custodian and which we publish regularly the data uh, every year in the state of food insecurity and nutrition report. Uh, so we took that indicator as one key element of this uh, food security and nutrition indicator and uh, together with child malnutrition, so uh, particularly underweight and stunting. Then we left education and change and the other changes we made were in the living standard. We slightly modify some of the details of the definitions of the uh, 
living standard to make them more relevant for what we believe is frequent in rural areas. So, in a way, uh, there were some uh, small scale adjustments uh, in this area, but the main thrust here is the same as the global MPI. Whereas the two dimensions which we included uh, uh, as new elements in this uh, um, uh, area were the dimension of rural livelihoods and resources. And here, as Hansel mentioned, we looked at assets. Uh, looking at assets uh, entails trying to uh, use some kind of uh, if-then condition by which uh, we try to say that uh, if a household has more than a certain share of income derived from primary activities like agriculture, fisheries and forests, then we expect the household to have access to certain type of assets like land or livestock or something like this. And then we had other elements like uh, the low pay rate and the child labor, which are part of the ILO decent work uh, uh, framework, and we believe they're an important element to define deprivation, access to social protection, and access to extension services as uh, uh, important elements. And then we added the dimension on risks. On uh, risks, basically, we uh, had two different type of things. First, we work with the climatic shocks. And here we were lucky enough as to be able to access georeference data that uh, defined the household's probability of being exposed to droughts and floods or high temperature based on the location of the households, uh, and uh, particularly in uh, um, exposure vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, critical crops that are grown in this area. So this was one element. Another element was the exposure and the coping strategies that the households uh, enacted as a, as a, a result of the exposure to the risk. And this is also something that is available from the uh, survey we've been using uh, and essentially trying to identify what are the uh, negative coping strategies that do uh, imply uh, deprivation conditions for the household uh, in terms of having to enact those. And we also uh, built a, a variable on credit denial, which is quite complex actually. It tries to understand whether the household was denied credit or was actually expecting to be denied credit. So something, something like this altogether. This is all we put together. And I mean, uh, all these elements imply some kind of uh, uh, adjustment of uh, challenge uh, uh, in terms of defining exactly what, uh, uh, what uh, we want to capture. Uh, the asset, of course, the risk is to uh, count as relevant assets that might be irrelevant to the households. For instance, if the household is only engaged in livestock and uh, is using very little land, we might be uh, uh, wrong in counting uh, the land. So that's why the if-then condition there. Uh, the labor, the low period, of course, is an interesting indicator, but it's not necessarily suitable for things like family work that is typically not paid or is, uh, is got an internal remuneration, but not an explicit one. Uh, the other issue is capturing child labor, which is not always easy and so on and so forth. So there are a number of challenges in uh, uh, identifying these indicators and building a deprivation profile. Then what we did was to uh, experiment uh, with this uh, structure, with this uh, rural multidimensional poverty index on a number of survey data. We picked four surveys that had uh, pretty much homogeneous information. And as mentioned, these are surveys of the uh, living, uh, living Standard Measurement Study of the World Bank. And if you see one commonality of these surveys is to have a widely rural sampling uh, that would allow essentially to work on this part. And this is what uh, we were looking for. And uh, so these are the main results that came out. Uh, of course, here, the first thing that is noticeable is that while the overall rural MPI is different across the countries and the headcount is quite different, whereas the intensity tend to be relatively more homogeneous. So uh, the characterization of rural poverty that we were encountering in these uh, uh, countries tend to be relatively uh, more homogeneous. Of course, we try to attempt uh, uh, one way of uh, packing the rural MPI and uh, uh, comparing with the other relevant measures. So we picked the global MPI in rural areas and we made a comparison. And here it's interesting to notice that in three out of the four countries on which we were working, the uh, rural MPI was capturing less poverty uh, in terms of the, of the total uh, uh, rural MPI compared to what the, the, the global MPI was capturing. So in a way, 
with the exception of Malawi, where the contrary actually seemed to be the case, the, the global MPI seemed to be capturing more poverty than what the rural MPI was uh, is capturing in this. Of course, the comparison here is very crude because we are dealing with the different uh, uh, data sources. The other thing that we looked at, of course, are the components, and we see that uh, essentially the two uh, components that we've been adding to the global MPI, the, two, the new elements, which are the risk and the rural livelihoods, do account for a significant share of the of the uh, uh, overall um, index uh, in all countries and uh, still the living standards tend to constitute the the highest and most important uh, uh, element of the picture and also food security food security came out as a as a, as a very interesting and relevant dimension of the of the poverty of the deprivation profile the other thing that we did was trying to run some robustness tests to try and understand what is the stability of the results vis-a-vis -vis changes in that K parameter. So if we change the percentage of indicators that we uh, use to define who is multidimensionally poor, what happens? And uh, this is a, is, a, is a trial that was done by breaking down the samples in each of the counters by subsample and see if the um, ordering of the subregions in terms of the rural multidimensional power would hold with the changes in the choice of the K parameter. And we see that there are some changes, but by and large, if we move between 10 and 50 percent, uh, uh, we don't see significant uh, overlaps or uh, changes of the of the of the results, which means that essentially of the ordering of the subregion, which means essentially that uh, the uh, um, uh, index is relatively stable vis-a-vis -vis changes of this parameter. We did also a number of comparisons, both with monetary measures. Uh, we built a monetary match, which is a, a, a monetary poverty uh, index that would give the same percentage of people in a condition of uh, uh, deprivation as the uh, rural multidimensional poverty index. And of course, we saw some discrepancies. But uh, in most cases, the uh, RMPI seem to be capturing uh, uh, things that are relevant in rural areas. We also did some uh, attempt to correlate the results to some proxies of, uh, of uh, uh, rural poverty, such as living in overcrowded households or being affected by malaria or being affected by diarrhea or being a small scale agricultural producer. And all these gave results that are by and large uh, telling that the index is pretty stable. The other thing that we did, and we believe this is a very important part of the effort, we, did, we tried to test in the field this index. Uh, so we, with the partnership with the University of uh, Malawi and Zomba, the Social Research for Central, uh, the Center for Social Research of the University of Malawi, and uh, a, a colleague, uh, a, a team of, local, of colleagues from Malawi went into the field uh, in a number of villages, in a number of locations that is here, to run a number of focus group discussion. Essentially, the logic here was to try and elicit by asking people uh, 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 in the locality what would they would perceive as characteristics of poverty in their context, try to elicit some validation of the choice of the indicators and the dimension we had uh, made. So, um, by asking people to define what uh, uh, makes a poor household, uh, this would, uh, would uh, um, tell how relevant those characteristics we had picked uh, might be for the, for the, um, for the uh, common targeted community. We ran 64 of this uh, uh, focus group discussion, which altogether gave very interesting results. Of course, these results are mostly valid from Malawi. We need to extend this to more. But uh, we found that most of the dimension appear to be relevant. There are some uh, outliers. For instance, uh, education in the case of Malawi was not uh, really mentioned up front, was something that was mentioned only after probing, whereas nutrition was uh, uh, appearing as something uh, very, very uh, relevant, and also the risk and copy dimension. Uh, um, although uh, the perception of this was uh, a, less, uh, a little bit less uh, prominent. Uh, so this is the, by and large, what we did so far with the index.
Now, what do we want to do? Our plan is to, uh, our conclusion is that the index is solid. Impedance care results so far are encouraging. Uh, the statistical tests give good, uh, good uh, uh, results. Uh, and uh, the index seemed to add something useful altogether to the um, poverty discourse in rural areas. The problem that we have is how much this index can be upscaled because it's pretty demanding in terms of the data that needs to be available. And particularly, uh, we have a shortage of consistent survey data. Uh, so uh, what we see is that there is some kind of trade-off between the consistency of coverage in each and every country, so the duplicability of the index exactly as it was conceived, and the uh, uh, um, uh, possibility to uh, cover many countries with it, so the possibility to upscale it to, uh, to upscale the calculation to many countries. And of course, we try also to work on uh, global data collection efforts that can help uh, um, having more of this data. And one example here in which we are involved is this project called the 50 by 2030 initiative that covers households and many farm bases. So very finally, and this is more really to open up a discussion, uh, what is the potential use that we see of this approach for the small islands developing states? Well, the first thing is that uh, we, I think that some of the, uh, of the specificity of poverty that we have been trying to capture, when capturing with the rural MPI, seem to be relevant also for the small islands developing states. And for instance, I can think of remoteness, which would be my one, one characteristic that might be uh, uh, implying lower or different way to access goods and services. Uh, and this may also be relevant perhaps for the small islands developing states. Certainly, I would see the risk dimension and its relevance and specificity for the seeds might be an important element, uh, along as, uh, as well as livelihoods. I mean, as defined by the type of environment, something that are certainly specific to the small islands development space. So in essence, the idea is that, uh, uh, of course, uh, a, an hypothetical seeds MPI would require some specific indicators, would not certainly be using the same indicator as the rural, uh, proposed rural multidimensional poverty index, but still perhaps some of these dimensions could be useful starting points. So the dimensions of risks, the dimension of livelihoods, we believe might, might constitute a useful starting point for uh, an application in this context. And this is really more of a, of a, of a question that we pose for, for discussion than anything else. Finally, that's the team. So uh, thank you for your attention. And allow me to mention that this was really a wide uh, uh, collaborative effort in between FAO, different offices in FAO, and the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative and the University of Malawi for the, for the field test. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, colleagues, um, FAO colleagues. And that perhaps is an excellent segue to our next speaker, who is from the Oxford Poverty and Human uh, development initiative and we are going to dive right in. Sabina, please, you have the floor. Thank you so much and greetings all. Um, I hope that you can stretch a little bit um, after that wonderful presentation and um, yeah, prepare for another measurement presentation um, where we are again looking at multidimensional measures and really trying to think about what we can learn from existing exercises that might be relevant. <clears throat> so, um, and I must say, I really enjoyed the collaboration with FAO uh, and colleagues that uh, Piero and Jose just presented. And I do think that that's a, a fascinating exercise and the, the comments about the new indicators of risk um, being relevant in SIDS are of course really quite interesting. Um, so first of all, let me just do a couple clarifications. What uh, Piero and Jose presented were an example of a comparable measure where they could look across many different countries using the same dimensions and the same indicators and compare them. And they can compare them nationally and potentially subnationally. And they mentioned the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index. Um, and that similarly has a structure. And what you may not know is that whether it's Latin America, whether it's ESQUA, um, that there are other regional measures that are being explored um, in, in other regions. Um, and the usefulness of having a comparable measure is 
really the ability to learn from each other um, and learn what works well, learn how to reduce it. Um, and these these comparisons seem to be the, the real benefit because in some countries, the measures will be much more relevant, but in some, they might be either too high or too low. Alongside that comparable measure are national multidimensional poverty indices or national multidimensional vulnerability indices, and I'll define them later. And these are measures that are tailor-made for policy in a national context. So the definition of poverty, the dimensions, the indicators, they change across countries. Afghanistan is very different than Ghana or than Colombia. They're computed as official permanent statistics of poverty um, that then you know, survive different kinds of transitions. And they are aimed primarily not just to monitor outcomes, but also to inform policy, budget allocation, targeting of poorest groups, whether it's individual or whether it's by region, um, coordination across different ministries of the government, and of course, comparisons over time to see are the poorest reducing poverty the fastest or are they being left behind? So um, these measures obviously resonate with the sustainable development goals, which move to look at poverty in different forms and dimensions to recognize interlinkages among indicators. And I think that's really the value added of the MPI uh, versus other indices is that they are based at the level of the household. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the methodology and then show you some examples for SIDS from, that are global, from the global MPI, and that are national, from three countries and their national MPIs, and then close with a couple reflections. Um, and I should say, although we can't touch on all of them, there are already a number of small island developing states that have reported national multidimensional poverty measures in the global SDG database. And these include the Dominican Republic, Guinea-Bissau, St. Lucia, and the Seychelles. Most of what I will talk about today, unusually, is focused on measurement and the decisions about indicators. But I think that for across all of the countries that have MPIs, um, the reason that they are constructed is in order to inform policies that will actually end poverty in all its forms and dimensions. So this is the cover of a 2019 book um, published posthumously by Sir Anthony Atkinson or Tony Atkinson, um, a great and beloved economist who worked all his career on poverty and inequality. And he observed in this last book that there's something different about measuring poverty. Yes, we're talking about numbers. Yes, we're talking about statistics, uh, rob robustness, data. But the most important function of a poverty measure is to motivate other people to act to end poverty. And so the link with action is distinctive. And so when we talk about poverty measures, when we try to decide what is the best measure for a given problem, the, the reason we need to think that question through very carefully is that we need a measure that's going to motivate people to tackle a key challenge, to tackle poverty, and give them the information they need to do that well. So I'm going to give a very simple explanation. Um, it'll take just four minutes, um, and it's something that my colleagues who are not technical geeks did um, because they complained about our formula and our matrices. So presume we have four people and we're looking at four dimensions of their life. Um, we're looking at their health, their schooling, their housing, and their nutrition or food security. Now, they are either deprived or non-deprived in these indicators because we've defined a very clear deprivation threshold, as Piero explained when he explained the methodology. So Miriam is not deprived in anything. Yeah. Uh, Linda has health problems and food security problems. Theo is deprived in everything. And David doesn't have uh, the minimum years of completed schooling. So the D, the orange boxes, are their deprivations. So how do we 
take this information on sort of a lived experience people have in different as parts of their life and turn it into a measure. The first thing we do is simply to count. Um, first person had zero deprivations. Linda had two, Theo had four, and David had one. Let's presume that these are equally weighted. So what can we see? Well, first of all, who is poor? It's not really evident because we need to set a different cutoff. We need to say, is it you're poor if you're deprived in two or three or four of these? Or is it just one? And so if the cutoff is you're deprived in two out of the four, 50 percent, you're poor. Then two out of the four people in this population are poor. And so the percentage of the population who are poor is 50 percent. And then the next stage is to try to say, how poor are they? And clearly, um, Miriam is deprived in two out of the four and Theo in four out of the four. So on average, they're deprived in three out of the four dimensions. So their intensity of how their bad their poverty is, is three out of four or 75%. So the multidimensional poverty index is a very simple. You take 50%, the percentage of the population who are poor, you multiply it by three quarters, the average intensity among the poor. And so you get six sixteenths or three eighths. So that's the math behind it. But what's the policy behind it? Now look at this. Let's say there's an intervention. And one deprivation was reduced. So now Theo has better health. The, the first column, he became non-deprived. The percentage of people who are poor hasn't changed, but intensity has changed. It's now down to five out of eight. And so MPI has gone down. And so it's sensitive to policy because you can see how people are poor. And if you move any deprivation of any poor people, then MPI goes down. That's the methodology. Um, and that's, in a sense, the link between methodology and action. But as Piero said, there are different ways of adjusting that methodology, and, and Jose as well, because the indicators and the definitions of deprivation have to fit the context. So let me give you um, an example. So the first example comes from a global multidimensional poverty index that we've constructed with UNDP since 2010. And everything that I have is online. Um, and it basically, its aim was to give a comparable measure of multidimensional poverty for over 100 countries in developing regions. And we re-update re it whenever data are available every year. And so it has three dimensions, health, education, and living standards, and 10 indicators. So for example, you're deprived in nutrition if anyone in your household for whom there is data are undernourished. You're deprived in child mortality if a child has died in the last five years. In years of schooling, if no member of the household has completed six years of schooling. Or in school attendance if a child is not attending school up to the age at which they would complete class eight. And the household indicators of not having clean cooking fuel, adequate sanitation, safe drinking water, electricity, uh, quality housing materials, and assets. And so for each person, you're going to look at those 10 indicators and give them a deprived or a non-deprived. So let's say the colors are deprived. And so this person is deprived in nutrition and five of the six living standard indicators. So then we add that up and it's 44%. If we have weights, where the weights are equal among indicators within each dimension. So that's the global MPI structure. And we can think of particular people, we can look at their lives with the qualitative work um, that also Fao did in Malawi um, to try to understand the accuracy and the inaccuracy of this measure. It leaves out work, it leaves out um, uh, empowerment or 
physical safety from violence or risk. So there are many oversights of this measure, but it is data constrained. So what is the information that comes out when we apply the global MPI in that way? So first, we know, for example, the percentage of people who are poor. In 2010, sorry, 2020, we had global MPI data for 17 of the SIDS, and they are pictured here. And in Cuba, less than 1% of people were poor, but also in Trinidad and Tobago, also in Maldives, also in Seychelles, very low poverty countries. Um, the higher poverty countries um, include Comoros or Haiti, Timor-Leste, Papua, New Guinea, and Guinea-Bissau. And so across the SIDS, the headcount ratio, the percentage of people who are poor, because they're deprived in at least one third, ranged from 0.44 to 67.3. But what you see in the red box is that 10 countries had less than 5% of their populations being poor by the global MPI. So it's actually not very informative. In the global MPI, we also have a second poverty cutoff, which we call vulnerability. You are vulnerable if you have 20 to 33% of deprivations, and you're poor if you have 33% or higher. So if we include vulnerability, those 10 countries um, that have less than 5% of their people poor have between 2 and 13% of their people poor. So it gives a more interesting deprivation, and it goes up to 87%. And by the way, if you disaggregate the SIDS by rural and urban areas, 86.5% of the population of these 17 countries um, live in rural, are, 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 are um, the poor in the rural areas. So it's 10.7 million across these 17 countries of the poor live in rural areas and 1.67 uh, million live in urban areas. So the rural indicators are indeed valid across this, but it's a subsample of the many, many SIDS. So beyond this overview of the level of poverty, we can zoom in. So for example, in Papua New Guinea, they don't have data on nutrition, but we can see the composition of poverty by indicator. What percentage of the population are poor and are deprived in each of the nine indicators that we have for that country? And you can see it's between 4% and 56%. That gives policymakers an idea, okay, how do, I, how do I allocate my efforts across these different indicators? And then the MPI can be disaggregated. So these are the subnational regions of Papua New Guinea, PNG, and the headcount ratio ranges from 5% in the national capital to 87% in Hela, the poorest of the regions. But what's also interesting is that you can look for each region at the composition of poverty by indicator because it's not necessarily the same. Now in PNG actually, the patterns are quite similar and we don't always see this across countries. We see a lot more variety in other countries. But if you look at the bottom at two adjacent regions, Central and Western Highlands, and look at the sort of purple indicators on the right, which are the education indicators, you see that education in Central contributes a lot more to poverty than in the Western Highlands, though their level of poverty is almost the same. And so different policies will be needed to move the needle on poverty between them. And remember, if you remove any deprivation of any poor people, MPI goes down 100% of the time. So that's a little bit of the link between a very general measure, the global MPI covers 5.9 billion people and 107 countries this year, and then some of the pinpointed detail by disaggregating and by looking at indicators of how this data can be used for policy. Finally, there's another definition of vulnerability. I'll come back to this at the end. One thing we can do, as I said before, is to change the poverty cutoff to be higher 
But another thing we can do is change the deprivation definitions. For example, to include not only undernutrition, but obesity. Or not six years of schooling, but eight or 12. Um, to include internet access and not just basic electric connections. And so to modify the definitions of indicators and to make a layered measure. Um, we've done an exercise for six countries um, and created a moderate multidimensional poverty measure in a way that's consistent with the global MPI, but going beyond it in some indicators. So this is a work in progress, but the methodology has already been uh, completed for all countries using a measure of destitution that we report each year. So that's a little bit about the methodology and a little bit about the global MPI that's comparable but irrelevant in Cuba where it's way too low and potentially you know, uh, not the right indicators in some of the other SIDS. So let's look beyond this. Remember I said that there are comparable MPIs and national MPIs. And in national MPIs, the indicators and dimensions are designed for the national context. So Maldives is one country that launched its national MPI uh, recently um, and is using it to track SDG target 1.2. And that's a picture of its national MPI report. And it has three dimensions. But the indicators are different. It has obesity as well as underweight and access to health care, for example. In education, it has years of schooling, but also access to the Internet. And in housing, um, it includes overcrowding. So all of the indicators are related to SDGs. And they also were able to look at changes over time over a seven year period. Maldives, the process of developing the national MPI in the Maldives was very much driven by the hope that it would serve policy. And so, for example, the minister um, it spoke at the UN General Assembly side event of the Multidimensional Poverty Peer Network about how he could use the MPI in terms of the, the policies uh, of planning uh, within that government. And the multidimensional poverty peer network is a south-south network. And so people can learn from each other how to use these measures for these different policy purposes. And Maldives also, in launching its MPI, you know, joins an international community, um, which include the regional countries. It includes the SIDS, and then it includes an international community, which is brought together in this south-south network. Another fascinating example is the Seychelles, who launched their MPI in 2019. Um, and the purpose was really, again, uh, a measure that would inform policy. And there was a lot of time, therefore, in consultations. And Seychelles actually launched a pilot measure before it created the final measure. But the final measure has four dimensions, so it includes employment, just like FAO included livelihoods. Um, and again, they are much more uh, advanced, perhaps, because of the context in Seychelles. It includes crime and living standards, for example. It includes substance use and abuse and teenage pregnancy and health. Um, and it includes unemployment, informal employment and NEAT in employment sector. Um, and while less than 1% of people were poor by the global MPI, Nearly 12% were poor by the national MPI in Seychelles, giving them a much broader view um, and enabling them to identify um, people who might feel that their situation was not understood if the poverty measure was too low. And like all of the MPIs, um, the Seychelles MPI is disaggregated by many different characteristics in order to really identify and understand the contexts of the poor. And the third example, I know I'm going quickly, but I just wanted to give you a taste. 
is the Dominican Republic National MPI. Um, it was launched in 2017, and, and in their case, they designed a special survey, purpose-built for the National MPI. And again, it was done with an aim to shape policy. And so they have five dimensions, housing, um, the digital divide, education, and um, the care of infants, uh, work, and health. And for example, in terms of interesting indicators, they have food security as well as illness, um, social, uh, health insurance, and child mortality in the health dimension. In the education, not only they have the education achievement, but also among school going children if they are lagged. And they also have childcare. Um, and in the living standard indicator, um, they also have some pollution types of uh, indicators and also being near a river that might flood. And the diff digital divide is, is quite interesting um, because it also includes discrimination and participation, very important indicators these days. And again, any national result can be broken down by indicator, by different geographic regions to go further and to give more information for shaping policies at a subnational level. So those are a little bit, just an overview of some of the ways that multidimensional metrics are used to measure poverty and then to link these poverty measures to action. And our observation is that the SIDS are an amazing community, but they have widely different levels of poverty um, and also variation between them in terms of the variables that would be relevant. And so if there were to be a comparable measure across all SIDS, um, as we saw with the global MPI, it might go from 1% to 67%. And so perhaps there would be a, a need to have multidimensional poverty indices that might be relevant in some of the poorer countries and vulnerability indices where there are higher standards for some of the less poor countries. And these could be higher either by having a different poverty cutoff of 20%, for example, instead of 33%, or by having slightly different indicator definitions that are more ambitious. Um, so those techniques are already written, they're established, they're implemented. Um, and they might be innovated upon in interesting ways in the SIDS. Finally, um, Piero and Jose closed with the recognition that all of this depends on data. And the question is, are there consistent data sets and ways that these can be disaggregated um, that would enable there to be comparisons across the different SIDS? So um, that's the presentation. Um, I wanted to mention that Seychelles not only has their own measure, but they also hosted the entire network in the Seychelles in 2019. Um, and many countries are participating in, the, in this network, but anyone in the call is welcome to you know, consider joining. Um, it's not a membership group. One joins by participating, and one joins in particular when a minister um, or vice minister from a country um, writes a formal request. And so if anyone on this call is interested in learning more, please do reach out to ourselves, to Corinne uh, Mitchell and to others at OFI. And we'd be very happy to send you information and connect you with Gonzalo Hernandez Licona, the director of MPPN. Um, but there are already, as I mentioned, a number of, of SIDS very active and taking leadership roles in this network. So thank you so much. And we look forward to the exchange. Sabina, thank you very much for a fascinating presentation. Um, I think you have raised a number of issues that uh, provide good food for thought. We are going to dive right into our third and final presenter for this afternoon. Um, Robert, over to you, please, right away. Thank you. Okay, thank you, colleagues. Um, I'm sure he's got the right... Yep, this should be it. Let me know if you cannot see it. It's good, Robert. Uh, Go ahead. Sorry, this, let me make sure we do everything like 
that out. Sorry. A little bit top. So a slightly different presentation um, or focus. Again, you know, working for the World Meteorological Organization, we're dealing with hazards, but also the, you know, the, the risk management, which I'll get into. So uh, just give you an overview of what we're doing um, with, with a little bit of focus on the SIDS. It's more of a um, global overview and just some maybe resources of, of where we can, you know, fit in some of these vulnerability issues um, for this, uh, the, the index work that you're doing. So just making sure I, I note the time. Um, so WMO is the uh, United Nations System uh, Authoritative Voice on Weather, Climate and Water. We have 193 members. Um, these are the National Meteorological and Hydrological Services. But as well, we have many regional centers that are certified um, that do a lot of um, operational monitoring um, and, and forecasting, seasonal forecasting. Um, so we'll get into it. Um, so we, we look at this um, in the terms, this is from the IPCC, I think the special report on, on disasters, on hazards, um, looking at you know, the risk equation, uh, which equals hazards, exposure, and vulnerability. You also have impacts in there. But as you can see in, in the, the talks that uh, we just had, and I'm sure for the whole webinar, you know, focusing on the socioeconomic processes is very important, but we also have the climate part. And we have the natural variability and the anthropogenic climate change. So that is the, the basis for really the talk. And I know it's going to sound slightly odd, but you'll see where this is going. But I, I focus, you know, there's a, a lot of hazards. And you'll see where we, this fits in into the framework of the UN and the post-2015 uh, UN uh, work. So obviously drought is this a, uh, this is a hazard I'll be focusing on today, um, is, a, is a deficiency of, of precipitation. And we typically look at the intensity, duration, and impacts. Um, so you can see already we're getting into drought, which is a, a good hazard to look at um, when we're trying to delve into the vulnerability uh, aspect of, of hazards. Of course, you have agricultural, hydrological, and socioeconomic impacts. Um, but, and I think this is pertinent uh, to what we're doing here, is that you know, effective drought management or any disaster risk management must be integrated across the sectors and within and between levels of government as well as NGOs. So looking at really this drought, and you'll see how this is connected into what you're doing, so again, we had the Warsaw Mechanism from the United Nations Framework Con Convention um, on Climate Change in 2012, and they want to quantify the loss and damage from extreme climatic events. So, you know, the, the magnitude of associated disaster losses um, and improved drought monitoring and management, are, again, fundamental to the Sundai and Hyogo Framework and also the SDGs. Of course, um, we need to look at the risk identification, um, drought early warning systems, and, and the impacts. So what's, I think, relevant for the, the conversation today is back in 2015, the, the WMO Congress, which is our gov main governing body with all 193 members attending, adopted a resolution that we will um, develop a framework on cataloging extreme weather, um, water, and climatic events. So again, if you're trying to determine vulnerability, you know, what period are you trying to look at? So, you know, for the SIDS, obviously the obvious hazard are hurricanes or tropical cyclones. You have a definite, you know, days of a start event to the end event. But for some other hazards, especially drought, it can be a bit more difficult. So again, that's what we're, we're, look, we're working on. Um, and in context, and I get into this a little bit, um, we have many partners and what we, I'll get into the Integrated Drop Management Program, um, also with the United Nations Convention to Combat, Combat Desertification. They have a drought initiative, uh, working on developing drop policies across the world. And also we have uh, talks or interactions with the Convention on Biological Diversity. So just very quickly, um, we have an integrated drought management program. Uh, the main sponsors are WMO and the Global Water Partnership. But we also have about 35 to 40 partners, which includes FAO, UNCCD, UNESCO, 
um, regional organizations and national organizations. Typically, they're going to be national level services, um, but mostly also universities as well. So this is the framework uh, of the talk that I'm trying to give. So we do look at three pillars of national drought management policy. Uh, of course, for WMO, you know, our specialty would be the monitoring and early warning systems, you know, what indices to use. And again, in the context of the program and our partners, we have a handbook on drought indices and many other hazards as well. Again, this goes back to the cataloging events or an activity that we're doing. But we also recognize that to do effective drought policy or disaster or hazard policy, you need vulnerability impact assessments. And of course, the, the number of um, national entities that are needed grows and international entities grow. And then also for the final pillar of drought preparedness, mitigation and response. Um, also, you can see their national disaster uh, mitigation um, offices, weather services, uh, ministries of agriculture, you know, health, finance, Red Cross, et cetera. And so sort they're of linking it together. So um, the whole framework here is to have a developed, successful drought policy. You need these three pillars. Again, this can be also done um, for other hazards um, and disasters as well. So again, looking at the vulnerability with respect to drought, um, you know, you have to do this by sector. Um, so who and what is at risk and why? The various agencies, organizations, and stakeholder groups. And also by region, um, you know, drought and, and hazards uh, and the subsequent possible disasters don't, do not know any boundaries. Um, so you have to, to look at that, especially within a watershed and also looking at the various communities, whether rural, urban um, and indigenous is very important. So to get back to the SIDS, um, we have done some work um, again on some, you know, small um, on, on the SIDS. This is in the Pacific, again, especially in the Pacific Islands and, and most islands, you have this, um, you know, sort of freshwater lens that, you know, is replenished by rainfall, but during a drought that de is depleted and you have saltwater intrusion. So while there's water everywhere, you know, that becomes a big issue on, on, on drought management. Likewise, uh, this gets more into the alerting phase, um, but this is just to focus on the Caribbean. And then to also to highlight, you know, our partner, we have a, what we call a regional climate center in, in based in Barbados, um, uh, the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology. And again, the first basis of, of doing these um, uh, drought policies is looking at what is going on, what's the monitoring, and of course the center offers those forecasts that then need to be integrated with um, user needs and also vulnerability and impact um, and looking at the preparedness strategies that these countries can have. And of course, with the SIDS, you will have a general um, you know, overview, like I said, with the, the freshwater lens issue. Um, so you can develop you know, policies across a region that can be uh, used by many countries. Um, one thing to also keep in mind is the impact reporting. Um, again, being WMO and looking at weather and climate and water data, we always feel that we don't have enough data, but actually it's the impact reporting um, that is again, very crucial for vulnerability assessments as well, that is very lacking. Um, so there's a few initiatives. Uh, this is an example from our partners in the US. Um, the Joint Research Center of the European Commission also has an activity on doing the reporting. And again, it's, it can be community-based. Um, it's it's um, based on GIS. Um, and they try to ground truth this as well, also from media reports. And the interesting point here is, again, trying to link this impact assessment with the monitoring that we're seeing. So we're cross-referencing, you know, what we see from either the weather stations or the satellite information um, to, to go forward. Um, again, why did monitoring drought impacts? Um, again, the impacts are becoming more complex. 
Um, and one thing, again, with the vulnerability issue that we see more and more, um, again, drought, as we defined it, is a very uh, defined event of a deficit of rainfall. So there can be a starting and ending time date. But then you have the issue of water scarcity as well, um, which can be um, you know, based on the climate. Uh, but also you can have you know, human-induced water scarcity, you know, over overuse of water. So that also um, complicates the issue, especially when you talk about vulnerability. So that's something to be to, to be taken to, pay, to be taken in consideration. Um, I'm just trying to move on so we can get to the most discussion point. Again, the reporting of these impacts um, need to be identified and validating. Um, and also looking at citizen science, which can be as important also on the vulnerability side. So I won't go into detail because I think everybody here is probably a, a, an expert on vulnerability. But again, looking at the list with, with, with regards to drought, the inability to expand the effects of a hostile environment, which is drought. Also looking at resilience. And I think the complication, I think as the, everybody knows for the, the last two speakers, vulnerability is dynamic. And of course, people, sectors, and communities and institutions differ in their exposure and vulnerability to risk, i.e. the coping capacity. Again, we talked about you know, who and what is vulnerable. I just want to move on and you can share this with the presentation. Again, the risk assessment, again, is who and what is at risk and why. Now, the last few slides are looking at examples of doing this. Again, it can be quite complex so I used an example from colleagues from the Joint Research Center in Italy, and this was mapping global patterns of global risks, an empirical framework based on subnational estimates of hazard exposure and vulnerability. And so looking at each one of these, and you have the link there that if you click on that Science Direct link, you go directly to the PDF. And what they've done here, again, this equation comes back, you know, hazard with exposure and vulnerability equals risk. And they try to do a global look at this, looking at the hazards, so looking at the rainfall, looking at the exposure, they focused on agriculture, also the grid population, livestock, baseline water stress. And then probably of interest to the, this webinar is looking at the vulnerability on the economic, social, and infrastructure. We presented this, and I think I have a next slide, again, in the context of the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. We developed a toolkit, and a number of partners contributed to this, and, and they developed a, a toolkit based on this vulnerability. So you can click on countries and take a look and see what they've done, especially on vulnerability. And we did a workshop um, when we used to travel, uh, I think it was in Guyana and the Caribbean, and it was interesting that a number of countries related that, you know, how you know, how can you say this? How can you develop the risk? But this is all, all these indices on these pages or, or information, what is common knowledge. It, it's it's um, something that's readily available. So we do, I think somebody did say capacity development and capacity building is very important. I totally agree. Uh, again, working with our countries and our member colleagues uh, and making sure that you know, they can use this, they can understand it, and then develop their own uh, indices for this, which is as important. And then just looking at, uh, I thought this was interesting, again, this is all in the paper of the different, again, um, sub um, factors they're looking at, you know, energy consumption, percentage of GDP of agriculture. Um, we had a talk on rural populations, refugees, et cetera. Uh, and you guys also have all the links there. Um, and this is what they, the final map that they did. This is a thing back in 2016. Again, just a gross measure. I think some of these methodologies might be useful. Um, also searching out the different data sets. Again, that's a, a, a huge challenge that we find, especially on the impact and vulnerability side. Um, this is a link to the UNCCD uh, toolbox, and there's a number of tools behind here. And so I do encourage you to look at that, and especially on the vulnerability and the, um, the, the mapping activity on the, on the drop risk as an example. Again, we were very uh, collaborative. You know, we had UNCCD, FAO, um, also um, the um, 
UN Center in the Netherlands, um, DHI, and also WMO. We also did a review of, of practices and policy recommendations on drought impact and vulnerability assessments. There's a link to that report. And this is my final slide. Again, we've organized, again, the information associated with drought on the different pillars. So there's a whole um, cache of information on vulnerability studies uh, associated on drought. Um, but again, just focusing from the hazard point of view, um, we're very focused on that equation of, of, of the risk management side of hazard exposure and vulnerability. So I hope that's within the time limit um, and happy to have any questions and discussions afterwards. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Robert. You were very efficient on the time, in fact. <laughs> All right, colleagues. So we've come to the the interesting part of our the other interesting part of our webinar which is the the discussions i think we had um three very useful uh presentations from from the colleagues um raising different aspects in my view um i think the first two clear link linkages between multidimensional indexes and 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 how they can be used for